I'm making a push to bring our neutral ground message of civil discourse in front of more people, but I need your help. Hit the subscribe and or follow button if you haven't yet done so, leave a kind comment or rating where applicable, and share an episode of the Neutral Ground podcast with some friends via social media. Welcome to the Neutral Ground podcast. This week, our special guest is PJ Weary. PJ is co-creator of Candid Goat Productions, which serves two incredible podcasts that I highly recommend, Chasing Leviathan, which I've actually been on as a guest, and Weary Dads. I've placed links to both podcasts in the show notes below, and I encourage people to check them out. In this episode, PJ and I grapple with quite a few big topics. We talk about the function of knowledge in the book of Job. We struggle with the concepts of individual versus communal suffering. We talk about Star Wars and the problems facing the DC Comics live-action movie universe. And there's, of course, no shortage of philosophy with names like Kierkegaard, Milton, the Romantics. And, of course, we throw in a little postmodernism, you know, just for some flavor. What happens when you get two philosophers in a room and give them each a microphone? We're about to find out. I hope you enjoy my conversation with PJ Weary. PJ, welcome to The Neutral Ground. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. Well, let me jump in by asking you about your podcast, Chasing Leviathan. Yeah. Now, I, I'm a, a big Herman Melville guy, and nobody talked more about Chasing Leviathans than Herman Melville. So when I saw your podcast, I immediately thought, this has to be great. And, and, it, and it is. Thank goodness. I appreciate I that. To yeah. it. Absolutely. I thought this can, this has to be about big ideas. And sure enough, even the subtitle for your podcast is about big ideas. So yes. nicely done. But I wanted to ask you about the origin of that. Where did that come from, from you? Um, so there's a couple different ways that all uh, kind of coalesce together. Um, one of them, uh, it comes from Job 41, uh, I knew that uh, my end goal is to go get a PhD in philosophy. And uh, while I do believe that I think we can make money from podcasting, if that's your main goal, you'll burn out really fast because it's, it's a long road. So I wanted to choose something that even if we didn't make money, I was getting value from the podcast. And so for me, interviewing people going uh, is sharpening my conversational skills, uh, my dialogue skills, and then also um, is just educating me. So learning to listen well, that sort of thing. So I was trying to think of how can I communicate this idea of, uh, depth and conversation and this idea. And, you know, you, you said you wanted to talk about the contentious atmosphere. I, I feel like modernism, people are like, okay, we're at, we're, we're capturing the truth. Postmodernism, we can't capture the truth. And that's, you know, these are brutal general uh, journalizations. I understand that. But the idea that truth is something worth pursuing, but it's not something that we tame and capture. And so, uh, I was thinking, I, I like fun names. I'm not a huge, you know, uh, so, you know, I, I do digital marketing and I, I do boring names all the time. And I just wanted to do something that was kind of eye catching, you know, obviously it worked for you. And so, uh, I actually had a dream, which was <laughs> formative for my, <laughs> <laughs> from my like a psychological standpoint for me um where i was floating have you ever seen a continental shelf mm -hmm. there's like a famous gif of like a someone diving off and it's it's when the water turns black even though it's clear because it's so far down and they're going down into it in my dream i was over that and leviathan swam out and it came out and i was I mean, it's huge. It was, it's eye was bigger than me and it came up and it just looked at me and I thought it was going to like, you know, at first I was scared it was going to eat me. Right. It's a dream. And then I just realized like how fantastic is this? And it doesn't even care about me. It's so big. It doesn't even care. And it's fantastic to look upon. And I'm glad I'm here. Even if I do, even if I do die, it's worth, it's worth seeing this. And so... <laughs> I didn't real. I didn't, sorry, I didn't, you know, I didn't mean to like jump on my therapist couch here, but, uh, that kind of gave me the idea of like, uh, pursuing truth is, is, a is actually a work of courage. It's, it's a scary thing. 
Because if you're truly pursuing truth, then you are always opening yourself up to changing core principles about yourself and saying, I yeah. don't know. That's actually really scary. I mean, you know, we talked about uh, last time uh, on, on my podcast about, you know, you, there's a balance between stability and chaos. And I do find myself edging more towards chaos just because I'm always pushing myself. And so that idea of pursuing something dangerous, but it's worth pursuing is kind of the whole idea behind that. Kind of coming out of Job 41 where it talks about, uh, you know, who grabs onto Leviathan. They'll, they won't they will grab him again. Like the, the struggle's too great. Who thinks they can subdue him? Uh, he rises up out of the sea and no one can handle him, right? And so... All that kind of together is where the, the idea for the podcast came from. I love it. And uh, probably about a month ago now in class, uh, I forced my students to read a chapter from Moby Dick. <laughs> 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 and it was uh, the symphony chapter, which is, I think, number 132. And mm -hmm. the reason why I make them read it yeah. is because it's it's the most beautifully written chapter. And mm. it it gets to the struggle and the potential even danger and, and the transformative nature of knowledge is where we yeah. go with it. Yeah. And it has one of the most beautiful lines. And of course, I'm going to flub it now off the top of my head. But essentially, it says Ahab leaned over the ship mm -hmm. and a tear drops into the ocean and never was there more beautiful tear. But then it says he sees his shadow mm. and... The more he tries to chase it, the more he tries to pierce the profundity, Melville says, yeah. the further down it went. And we just talk about the idea of chasing knowledge and yeah. how there does have to be this kind of balance as well yeah. between chasing knowledge too much to your destruction. And mm -hmm. yet at the same time, you must chase knowledge. You must chase in some ways understanding or at least a better understanding of yourself and the world around you. And my, well, let me ask you this then. Yeah. Do you have a, do you have an affinity for the book of Job? Uh, the wisdom books in general, um, you know, uh, I grew up independent fundamental Baptist, not there now, but um, <laughs> the, uh, so my version of my goth stage was like reading and rereading Ecclesiastes. You know, mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, it's all vanities. It's all emptiness anyways. You know, like thinking I'm really deep at se in seventh grade. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, seventh grade uh, wisdom is the best, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it's so simple. You guys just don't get it. It's so simple. No. Um, exactly. So uh, I, the wisdom books just kind of, uh, I've always felt that. Um and enjoyed that, uh, went through Job. Uh, I have a hard time getting into the full dialogues of Job. I love the whole discussion of wisdom in Job 28. I find myself mm -hmm. reading and rereading that. And I find myself just drawn to uh, Job 41, probably because, um, you know, I think everyone has a little bit of thalassophobia, you know, the, the fear of the ocean. And mm. that was something that like, probably just because of my nature, I was drawn to the mystery of it, right? I was drawn yeah. to the danger of it. And then just coming to realize like, even what you were talking about here, you know, you're trying to pierce the profundity, but you have to keep, keep going. Um, it's valuable to pursue, but just that how important it is to realize you're pursuing something bigger than yourself. It's not a predator prey relationship, if that makes sense. And so, yeah. uh, yeah, I just like uh, I just find myself going back to Job and reading that description, and uh, and I, I think the the metaphor I've created with chasing Leviathan fits the point of the passage, which is I am God, um, and I have made Leviathan, and you can't handle Leviathan, but I created him, and so that's like for me as a devout Christian, as I'm pursuing truth, I'm recognizing that I am, I, I'm still under authority. I am not, uh, it's not like, uh, by studying theology, I'm going to understand everything about God. Like, <laughs> and, and that's, mm -hmm. a, it's such an odd thing. Uh, I see this from both Christians and, uh, atheists in some of those debates. I did my master's in philosophy of religion where you have both sides talking about how does God make sense? 
and then no one stops to ask it's like I, are we supposed to understand everything about god you're talking about a being that is infinitely different in scope and power and uh, i'm okay when i can't figure out everything about god because it would be really odd if i could and so i I, I, that's kind of a rambling answer, but um, uh, Job 41 has definitely been a, a big part of that. Yeah, I don't think you rambled at all. I, I thought, I, I have always had an affinity for the book, for Job yeah. specifically. Not just because of the Leviathan uh, aspect of it, but similar to what you just mentioned, it's this, either you come to terms with what God says or not. Right, God's point is, yeah. can you do these things? And of course, the answer is no. No, right. you can't. And what makes it worse, I had a student years and years and years ago who was in my office, and I, I had taught the book of Job in a class, and he just came in so upset <laughs> because he was like, I just, I can't reconcile what what is happening here. I can't reconcile his suffering, and we'll we'll talk a little yeah. bit about individual suffering in a, in a bit. But sure, specifically with Job, he said, "I just I can't do it." And I said, "I don't think you're supposed to." Right. I, I'm not necessarily sure that you're supposed to reconcile this as some wonderful wonderful moment, other than God's attempt to try to explain what you can't know. And how at a certain point you have to just accept that. Yeah. I, uh, my eventual goal is to write a great big book of philosophy. You know, this is that pie in the sky kind of dream. Uh, giving like a Christian philosophy of art. Which, you know, Heidegger would say is a nonsensical, but, you know, Heidegger was a Nazi, so who cares what he thinks. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the uh, as I, as I'm thinking about that, what I love about Job, because um, I've often found myself bouncing back and forth between like philosophy and fiction, and uh, my big pursuit in a lot of ways has been what is the what is truth in fiction? You know, Plato says it's just lying, and uh, Oscar Wilde and I, I, we might have talked about this before, but Oscar Wilde's like it's just fancy lying. Like he loves that, he revels in that. We're we're the best liars. Um, but as I'm listening to, to Job and even what you're talking about, one of the reasons that fiction is hard to describe is I think the, the truth value that is in fiction is precisely the kind of truth value you don't get in explanation. So it cannot be explained because it's doing something that explanation cannot. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at Job, there are explanation, there's explanation that happens, but it's that marriage with the story and you feel what's happening to Job. And it's not totally explainable. And that's kind of the value of fiction. Like that you're, and this goes into the discussion about individual suffering. Until we understand particulars, like universals without particulars often end up in very dangerous places. Armchair philosophers without getting into, and I think that's the value of fiction that we create empathy and a lot of times that gets dragged into just pure ethical regions. It's like, no, no, no. It's a, it's a distinct form of knowledge. And so, yeah, um, yeah I, I think that's kind of uh, where, where a lot of this, uh, what, like, I think it's a good lead into what we're talking about here. But when you talk about Job and it's like, I don't understand all of Job. And it's like, well, that's kind of the point because it, it's a story. Right? Like stories can be endlessly reinvented in terms of their application. Right? And I don't mean that in a way that uh, that means they can mean anything. But they give you continual uh, ways of uh, mythologizing. I use that in the more technical sense your own life. Uh, Kant talks about um, productive, the productive imagination. And I believe they're called productive judgments. So there's two types of judgment. Uh, if I'm not using the correct term, I apologize. But for Kant, you have judgments that, uh, so for instance, you look at a rose and you're like, oh, that's beautiful. And you take the rose and you put it under the category of beauty. That's one type of judgment. I believe that's descriptive. I could be wrong. Um, it's, been, it's been a hot minute. 
But then there's what he calls uh, productive judgment. And that's where you choose to take something and make it the foundation for the category. So for instance, when you're a kid, you like, I grew up with Kraft macaroni and cheese. My idea of good food was Kraft macaroni and cheese. <laughs> and then I remember the first time I had sushi, right? Uh, the, uh, excuse me. The first time I had good sushi, because there's nothing worse than bad sushi. Oh, and yes. that's one of my favorite foods. And I was like, it actually, instead of being brought under the good food category, it began to define good food. So I still love Kraft macaroni and cheese, but I don't sit there and say, this is the pinnacle, right? Um, and this is very important. This distinction is very important for our society um, because we are constantly making these two different types of judgment. And the, one, the people that we use as our exemplars, because human beings need particulars, an mm -hmm. exemplar there is just like the exemplary example, which I'm sure is not the uh, the technical definition. It, but that that exemplary example, the exemplar, is so important. Uh, you know, you look at Achilles' courage versus like, or Achilles as as a man, or the definition of manliness versus like John Wayne's definition of manliness. It's like very very different conceptions of either courage or manliness and all that sort of thing. I love the idea of moving John Wayne into the Iliad. That would be, <laughs> it would, would be a be very a different story. <laughs> or, or putting uh, Achilles in, you know, the Cowboys or something and, yeah. and leading the, the young men in that. That would be, uh, be pretty fun to watch, honestly. Do well, you know, it actually, that, I almost oh. think you could think, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, no. Go ahead. Uh, I, I just made this connection and maybe it doesn't work. I don't know if you've ever seen Unforgiven. It's one of my favorite movies. With oh, Clint absolutely. Eastwood, yeah. I almost think you could almost think of Clint Eastwood as an Achilles type character, because he's reluctant to fight until his until his brother falls. Right. He has this reputation. No one's really seeing it. He's seen he's seen as kind of like a coward and a baby, and he kind of fights when he has to. And then all of a sudden, his brother falls, and then and then the courage comes out. Now, does that, does that function as a kind of ideal, like what you were talking about, the exemplar character? I, I only say that because he, he wants to... Eastwood's character, of course, for those who haven't yeah. seen it, his wife has passed away. Yeah. He was not a good man his entire life. He lived, you know, his own kind of code. But then yeah. through his wife, he, he gets himself on the right path. And yep. he desperately wants to stay there. Until yeah. he, it's kind of brought out of him a little bit, but it's only after, like you said, the death of Morgan Freeman's character, and I'm, I'm forgetting the name at this point, but yeah, yeah it's been once a, that it's character, been a while. yeah, it's, yeah, once that character passes away, it's like forget it, I'm back, I'm back. He to, starts to drinking. Where was he right? Because drinking he, everything again. he did, yep. he doesn't remember any of the stories because he he everything he did, he was so drunk he doesn't remember. Um, and now is that is that an ideal in the sense that I, I will not, I will control myself yeah. until there comes a point when I have to let that rage, like Achilles does, actually the yeah, same yeah, yeah, thing, yeah. like you said, let that rage out. And when that rage is out, you, you best just get out of my way. Is that a kind of ideal or is it more ideal to simply walk away? So uh, kind of interesting, it, it, the difference between an exemplar and an ideal is an ideal is the exactly what you're shooting for and an exemplar can have flaws it is mm. all the little minutia and the other thing about uh this kind of uh i hope i'm using the right term i mean it, it makes sense it comes from the productive imagination you you create something but productive judgment is that's something the audience determines who their exemplar is going to be so a good example it's not written into the story it's actually something that we make decisions about the story. So for instance, when you look at, um, and I, I have to confess, I've never seen Fight Club, but I do know that the whole point, I've read other things by the same author, is it's supposed to satirize certain types of like toxic masculinity. And, but, and we see this, you know, a good, uh, another good example is like the Joker in all his different facets, right? Sure. People t tend, uh, there are definitely people who will unironically proclaim that the Joker is a hero, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is like, that's not the author's intention. <laughs> it's not. Yeah, it goes back and, to, to John Milton and, and Milton Satan from Paradise Lost. 
where the romantics read him as the hero of the story, the tragic figure who is yeah. unjustly tyrannized by by God. So yeah, absolutely. Keep going. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, no, exactly. So uh, the exemplar is our, our culture tends to take certain stories, and we can see this, and that's why I use John Wayne, because at least for me growing up, I heard from my dad, my grandpa. My grandpa's probably watched Big Jake probably 40 times, 50 times. It's unreal. The man loves John Wayne. Um, and so we take certain characters, certain people, and we elevate them to a pedestal of like, this is why, you know, it, more than the ideal, you see people copying, um, and I was just reading this in, uh, oh, his name escapes me. Uh, he wrote uh, Secular Age, Charles Taylor. Um, but he talks about, uh, in the language animal, habitus. And I'd not heard this term before, but it, it's that connection between um, universal and particulars, right? There's mm. our culture, the big culture that kind of exists. Um, if you're, you know, you're looking at that hermeneutical circle and then there's individuals and habitus is the way that we conduct our bodies, the codes of conduct that ingrain values. So for instance, making your bed is something that normally corresponds to certain cultural values, but it's ingrained in a specific action. Um, uh, and I don't even know if this is true, but it would be a good example if it is, uh, in America, we don't slurp when we eat. I have heard, I have not experienced this, but that in China, they slurp when they're eating soup. Maybe that's like one of those cultural myths. It doesn't matter for the purposes of this. You understand the point is that that's them being polite because they're showing they like the soup. And that's it, it. So it allows that for me was an important moment because I recognized, oh, this is the connection between big culture and individuals are the ways that these things get embodied. And that's why we often break things down to this guy is my hero. And so more than even just like courage, I'm like, I want to be like John Wayne, or I want to be like Achilles, or um, to be honest, John Wayne was never, I, I, I always saw myself more as like Gandalf or Merlin, you know, like, obviously, like, I was always the mentor figure, like, the fact that Sword in the right. Stone, I just loved watching that because I wanted to be Merlin. That's obviously feeds into all like, PJ just likes to learn things. So, um, but that's a, that's a whole, like, and I, I, you know, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Donald Miller. Um, mm -mm. so, uh, he's a evangelical writer, uh, has now become like a marketing guru. It's like whatever. But, uh, I remember he wrote a book on manhood and he grew up without a dad. And for him, his, he didn't like sports. He didn't like anything else for him. The ultimate man was Ferris Bueller. And that's going to create a whole different set <laughs> You know, he was like, he was, a, he was a teenager, right? That's going to create a whole different set of not just because it's not just about like what is courage or what is, you know, for Ferris Bueller, you, you start to dress like him, you start to act like him, you pick up mannerisms. And so that's kind of when we talk about an exemplar, it is slightly different from an ideal because an ideal is normally a little more abstract. It's part of that bigger culture, mm -hmm. whereas like uh, an exemplar gives you um, something to model after. And so it gets down into minutia as well as it's that connecting bridge, if that makes sense. Yeah. And definitely, um, I mean, Ferris Bueller, that's kind of a, it's an interesting <laughs> character too, because it's kind of a, yes. a Loki, Loki-ish figure. But yeah. at the end of the movie, of course, he, he takes, he takes responsibility or attempts to take responsibility for the day. But right. wow, that that's a heck of a of an exemplar, honestly. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's like he, it, and it makes sense like um for certain like I, I we find certain people that we want to make our heroes right and then that becomes like subcultures you'll see different uh it, it's it's how stories interact and they create power inside the culture if that yeah. makes sense um it so. does and, and you know what what's interesting to me too about the this idea of heroes one of my heroes always growing up anytime Anytime a, a teacher would give me the opportunity, write an essay on whatever you want. I always pick the same thing. Jackie Robinson. Yeah. Always Jackie Robinson. And here's why I found him so fascinating, even as a young man. Even uh, his, his wife even attests to this, hmm. that he was an incredibly proud man, like to the point of almost like sinful pride. Yeah. And yet what was the one thing that he had to suppress more than anything as he was going through that horrible time? breaking the color barrier in baseball, he had to overcome his pride. 
Mm. He had to. There was no other way to do it. You know, he's being told by Branch Rickey he had to do this from the beginning when he signed his contract with the Dodgers. And that, to me, always stuck out because I always kind of wondered, could I overcome one of my worst traits, let's say? Yeah. Right? Prior to, to that level. And so just thinking about that even today makes me consider how I treat others, how I act. Am I doing my best to suppress my own you know, bad traits that I carry with me? And, and so this idea of the exemplar and carrying that minutia of also potential problems, what you made me think of was that these foibles that we have mm-hmm. can actually be sources of great power and great education as well for ourselves. Yes. Yes. And it, it, it obviously just feeds into um, learning and experience from other people. And one of the values of fiction in that regard over nonfiction is that you, when you're doing, when you're reading nonfiction, like a biography or something like that, the question of uh, veracity and accuracy becomes really important and it always sticks out. Whereas in fiction, the only thing that's being communicated is the the mindset and the and the minutia. You know the minutia work because they're written into the story. The only time the minutia don't work is when someone disrespects the logic of the story. Mm. Um, and I, yeah. I think we've all experienced that. I, I remember reading, um, and now I think mean, this this kind of dates me a little bit, but uh, I don't. I loved Star Wars as a kid. It's mm-hmm. kind of I've kind of grown out of that now. Um, <laughs> it's got it's just gotten Never. weird. Everyone everyone just like <laughs> I mean I'll watch the the old ones with my kids, but it's just gotten this point where like I just don't want to have an opinion on it. Like everyone just fights over it. I'm like I just don't care. Right. Um, I read all the extended universe novels like back in the day. Um, so and now they're not canon, and people are like oh they just don't like it's like they don't exist, but they do. I like whatever. Um. But I remember one particularly uh, where the big twist in the story was that uh, these uh, they mentioned these pillars of crystal, the whole book. And like Luke Skywalker is going around, and he's like fighting the remnants of the Empire or something like that. And then all of a sudden you find out that the, the pillars of crystal are sentient, sentient and <laughs> and they can use the force. What? Yeah, I, I was like... And I, I'm three quarters. I'm like, I'm almost done with the book. It's like in the last 20 pages. It's supposed to be this big reveal. And I just felt cheated because it solved all the problems. Like, oh, and the whole time the crystals were actually life forms and they're using the force to save everybody. And I was like, no, there was no, it, what was the point? You know what I mean? Like, I mean, it was so hard to like, it didn't, there wasn't any of the things that you would uh, appreciate in terms of. Uh, a journey or any of that stuff. And so I think we all, um, you know, there wasn't the payoff that you, that you expect. And as much as like people want to emphasize creativity and writing, there are certain things like you have responsibilities to the reader or else you're going to end up with something the reader hates. A uh, great example of that is, uh, the old suicide squad. Um, I don't know if you ever watched that. Uh, but, and this just goes to show that editing is really important. They did multiple takes and, uh, the Boomerang character, Captain Boomerang, I think his name is. Yep. He has mm-hmm. his favorite fluffy stuffed animal. And it shows up multiple times at the beginning of the movie. Mm-hmm. And he keeps putting it back inside his pocket. Do you know where I'm going with this? Yeah, it's Chekhov's it's gun. So, or Chekhov's fluffy bunny is what it ends up being. Do you remember what happens? They edited it poorly. They did a different take. Someone throws a knife at him. It beds in his chest. This is like at the very end of the movie, you think he's dead, but everyone's like, okay, what is it? You know what it's going to be. It's going to be the fluffy bunny. Pulls out thick wads of cash. Does not pull out the bunny. From the same from the same pocket that they've been showing the fluffy bunny the whole movie. And I just sat there and I was like, who who was working at three in the uh, in the morning and thought uh, like just didn't watch the whole movie and say, hey, maybe we should use the take where we set this up like three or four times during the whole movie. But that was like, that was just the the problem with that whole movie. It, it was incoherent. So anyways, well, yeah, I, I digress. Entire, but... No, no, no. <laughs> digress away. <laughs> the, these, because I can talk about this forever. The, the problems with DC specifically, how they've handled their live action <laughs> stuff. 
is yeah. absolutely I mean and and we can tie this in of course to our larger discussions on on narrative and postmodern versus neo-modern and stuff like that because the complexity that that DC was going for in their live action universe the DCEU was a type of of postmodern narrative that people I think were just not they just didn't care like for example Suicide Squad we'll stay there for a second because yeah. Suicide Squad by its definition is postmodern. We're going to take these evil figures, make them heroes. And yep. that that by itself doesn't make it good or bad. It actually is quite right. it's always been kind of an interesting idea to take the the bad guys and make them good, right? That Dirty idea. dozen but it's, great movie. Absolutely, absolutely. But you or even the Magnificent 7 too even, right? I mean, yes. it, it's to you know, you it's a good idea, but when it's executed poorly, like it was with Suicide Squad, you just end up with no payoff at the end. No kind of sense of, of release, no kind of sense of that you've been a part of a, of a journey that mattered. I have not yeah. seen the second one. Have you seen that one? Uh, I mean, it's James Gunn. He does a much better job of doing something very coherent. I think uh, I'm not a huge fan of gore for gore's sake. Or mm -hmm. <laughs> I try not to be. I mean, there's definitely like that male testosterone that's like, yeah, you know what I mean? I, I enjoy <laughs> watching Gladiator. But I mean, when every single death is uh, it, like literally heads exploding and just like gore across the screen, it's like, okay, it doesn't happen every time. And it just, it, I, very clever at certain points. There's some really amazing cinem, uh, what's the word I'm like? Uh, cinematic. Uh, choices that James Gunn makes, uh, some camera decisions he makes, some characters' point of view. Um, I don't want to give away too much, but like, if you have seen the movie, uh, I think it's like Mr. Polka Dot or whatever. Absolutely phenomenal what he did with that. Very clever. But the choice to just like every single death is incredibly gory. Is mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, we've we've strayed into just voyeurism at this point. But that's him giving. Unfortunately, sometimes you know the like. Some people are drawn to Suicide Squad because they like that idea of the story. And some people are like, it's an R-rated Marvel movie. You know, I'm going to get right. to hear the F word and lots of violence. And he's like, I'm going to deliver. And it's like, I mean, that's not why I wanted to watch it, but okay. Um, <laughs> if that yeah, makes I'm sense. more into the concept than anything else. Yes. I, I like the concept yeah. of, of the, the bad guys made good, that postmodern feel to it, I think is, is always interesting to me. Well, something I think that will connect all of this kind of together is and something I'm, i've been struggling with a little bit dealing with narrative sure. suffering all this stuff so you have certain you know a lot of big data today big data readers yes. people like steven pinker who talk about how the data all shows us that the world has never been safer the world has never been better and i struggle with reconciling that against the suffering individual yeah because if you say the world is is better than it's ever been how does that in any way not mock the individual who is suffering? And I'm not even sure what we're supposed to do with that because I, I, I can make an argument for why the data is important. It certainly right. shows a certain evolution, a social evolution maybe even of us as a species. But when people throw that out as an argument, that's when I start to go, I'm not quite sure what to do with this. So what do you make of that? Uh, to be quite frank, I haven't read any stinkin', Steve, <laughs> stinkin', oh my God, uh, Steven, <laughs> Steven Pinkner, is that how you, like, Steven I haven't Pinker. read any of his, mm -hmm. Pinker, um, so, uh, but I am familiar with the idea, um, it's interesting because we've talked a little bit about, there is a tendency, people tend to go towards certain personality types and they tend to, towards certain solutions. Right. Um, I love systems. I find them endlessly complex. They're really interesting. But one of the dangers, and this is why I think I appreciated uh, Kierkegaard um, and studying him, or apparently it's pronounced Kierkegaard in his native language. Like, I mean, this is just the stuff is that, that right? I, I need to go to. I need to go to school, like, <laughs> so I can talk I never to somebody. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Uh, in in uh, in uh, Danish, excuse me. Uh, mm. I believe that's how it's pronounced. But Kierkegaard, what, like we want people to know who I'm talking about, right? 
Um, when you look at uh, Kierkegaard, one of his biggest things, um, and I think this has been very helpful for me, is you have subjective, uh, you have subjective truth, objective truth, and then you have absolute truth. And really, it's uh, I, I, that might be a little bit misleading to call them different types of truth. But the idea for him was, and this is his critique of Hegelianism. It, Hegelianism, and I'm not going to lie, I read 150 pages of Hegel because I knew I needed to understand where what Kierkegaard was critiquing. And I got 150 pages in, and I didn't understand any of it. And then on one page, it clicked. And, of course, it's a, a very... Simpli uh, simplified version, it clicked and I got mad and I threw the book across <laughs> across the room because I was like, that was that could have been way simpler. Why did you do it like that? Um, but I, he, he had reasons for it and I understand that. Uh, the idea of uh, thesis, antithesis, and synthesis with Hegel is basically that the best of culture keeps moving forward and keeps progressing. Uh, and that's a very like oversimplified version, but Basically, that you know, the synthesis become has becomes the new thesis. And then you have the antithesis, synthesis. You, you understand? I know that you know what I'm talking about here. Um, and Kierkegaard uh, basically says, object uh, objective truth is this idea of what the experts agree on, right? And then subjective truth is the is what people uh, are experiencing and knowing to be right. Uh, by themselves kind of like the the it, it, in a lot of ways what we're talking about here is um particulars versus universals or individuals versus mm -hmm. systemic thinking and so the last one is absolute truth and the and this is the whole point of fear and trembling with kierkegaard that abraham like <laughs> I, I i think all of us would agree with this the idea no one would objectively say that sacrificing your son is the right thing to do, right? We'd hope so. And yeah, yes, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I let like um, not that you know, not that it necessarily puts me in the best company, but I remember Woody Allen making a joke. Um, uh, how did how did Abraham know it was God? Well, it had just the right timber and bass in the voice, you know, that it was the voice of God speaking to him, right? And it's like there is no objective way to prove that it was God speaking to Abraham. He just knew it was a question of faith, and he made that decision. Uh, and when we get into this kind of territory, again, it doesn't matter the factual veracity of God speaking, you know, whether you're Christian or not, God speaking to Abraham. The point is, is that Abraham acted on that. And the point of the story is he acted on that. And it was true, even though his culture would not have recognized it as such. And so it's very, and, and I think I can bring this back around here. Even if you have 99.9% .9 accuracy, we live in a world where there's still that 0.01% or 0.0001%. And it's not going to change for that one person. That one person has access to a truth that is true absolutely regardless of whatever objective facts and stats we are putting into it. I'm conflating a few things here. I'm simplifying. But basically, you cannot deny particulars in the name of the system and and say it's false it's still true and i think a lot of times that's where um you know uh the dominant narrative was uh white based through the 50s right <laughs> like through the mm -hmm. majority of american history and that was just people like well most of america is happy right because white people live better lives than black people at that point. And so we can discount this narrative. And that's where we've talked about postmodernism bringing in like yeah. minority voices is really important. Um, where it gets, it just becomes, that, that's just one example. Over and over again, uh, what you'll find is, uh, and I forgive me, I'm hopping around a little bit, but uh, I found a lot of connection between that and James Gleek wrote a great book on chaos theory. And one of the things we don't realize is, uh, I'm not, are you familiar with him? Are you familiar with what? I'm not, please. Okay. Yeah. So 
the idea of chaos theory and uh, basically he was this genius and he saw, he helped, he was working at this government mathematical institute and he helped so many people solve so many problems and there, and, but he never did his own work. And then he came out with chaos theory and it was just totally different. He was just looking at the world in a different way. Most people don't understand the, the butterfly effect. The point of the butterfly effect is not that little things have big consequences. It's that we cannot determine how those little things will interact to make big consequences. So, and this is true, and this is kind of mind boggling. We could put sensors around the entire earth, uh, every foot squared up through the stratosphere. And mm -hmm. we would still only be able to predict the weather up to two weeks away. Because the differences, the minor fluctuations in the, in between the sensors within a foot of space would ultimately create, uh, mathematically would create vastly different results over, uh, at, at a certain point. I don't, I don't know if that made sense. Should I try and no, no, say it, it again or? Yeah, no, no. I, the, the idea is, is there's only, again, it kind of actually circles back even to Job. Uh, because yeah. the idea is there's only so much that you can know as it yeah. is over a certain period of time and so much that you can predict. My uh, my brother-in-law is actually um, <laughs> actually predicts the weather for the uh, oh. <laughs> National Weather Service. Yeah. And uh, of course, we always joke with him, you know, about, you know, the, how people are saying, how could they be, be wrong so many times? You know, but in actuality, it has to do with what you're talking about, that there's only so many data points that you, you can even use or have yep. access to, to be able to predict. And then of course, those data points can switch at a given moment, and that can change the entire model for the weather yes. for, th for the next day even, or even the day yes. of. And that's what people don't realize about life. It, and that's where I think the whole chasing the Viathan makes sense. At any moment, I could ch find a detail that is just really problematic that forces me to reevaluate everything. And so that's like, even as we're talking about individual suffering and it's better than it's ever been before, um, there's value in that. I do believe that. Um, but I don't want, like, we cannot discount the, the reality of details. And ultimately, if you, if you get too systemic, eventually your system will get flipped. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's because you're thinking, you get caught thinking a certain way. Um, I, and I think I'm, we've talked about this before. One of my favorite anime is, uh, Ghost in the Shell. And this was really helpful for me. And it's actually been helpful for me in my business. Um, uh, it goes back to what, um, we're talking about here. You have a security force that's run by, um, their, uh, cyborgs. Uh, they have human brains and, uh, machine bodies and they're they can do unbelievable things. They can jump from 10 stories down and they'll bust through the concrete. They, you know, they can do ridiculous things. And the, the, uh, major who runs the operation hires a real human, like completely, uh, human person to work with them. And everyone else on the team is like, why? And he's like, you know, kind of, she's like, I bet you're wondering why you're on this team because you know, he's like, he's kind of a liability. <laughs> Right? Yeah. Like he's very fragile. They're doing like the like special ops type stuff. And she's like, when everybody's the same, you'd miss important signals in the system. Yeah. And that's ultimately when you, when you, when, when the narrative is all the same, when you don't listen. And that's where I think like, I mean, for me, that fiction has become more and more as I've been able to articulate it. I don't think it's fully explainable, but I think there, there are little sideways paths into it. You have to have different stories and it doesn't matter how, uh, true they are to a statistical extent, extent, right? You could have like, oh, um, only like 1% of people experience what's happening in the story, right? It's like, but we need that. We need to know that because it gives us insight into the whole of the universe because yeah, you're the, making well, me think of, of even, um, the, the, one of my favorite cartoons, the Justice League cartoons, right? And something that happens in the Justice League is Batman, of course, has contingency plans for all of the other superheroes, Superman yes. on down, Wonder Woman, all of them. 
and I love that movie. The, but yeah, go ahead. Uh, but and and even in the the series itself, he he tells Green Arrow at one point he throws Latin at him, and I, I can't repeat the Latin because I don't know it. But it ultimately breaks down to who's watching the Watchers. Yes. And yeah. so even though he and Green Arrow are one of the few just purely humans yeah. in the group, Batman trusts Green Arrow as a human to watch the other superheroes. Yeah. And so there's something interesting in that because they both have, I don't want to say more more connection, but they they certainly have more to lose. And they certainly come from a different angle, a different point of view, right? Because Superman, he can jump into any situation and pretty much know that he can survive it. <laughs> Do but Superman Batman, things. even with all yeah. of his yeah, <laughs> Batman, even with all of his toys, he's got to be careful. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the whole point of uh, Watchmen, right? I mean, literally, the mm-hmm. whole point behind Watchmen is watching the Watchers, and I, I mean. Uh, in some ways, I almost think uh, Alan Moore took a, a soft approach because uh, Superman is this beautiful. He really is more of an ideal than an exemplar, right? Like, yeah. he's, he's a very abstract idea. And the idea that someone with that much power would be exactly like that. Um, also, <laughs> also the fact that the reason he's that good is because he was raised as a farm boy in Kansas is like, it's so self-serving. But... <laughs> <laughs> but it's wonderful, isn't it, though? Yeah, wonderful yeah. to believe. I'm sure yeah. there are families in Kansas who are like, we're going to raise you just like Clark. <laughs> just yeah, just exactly like Clark right. Kent. <laughs> um, but, I mean, and there's there's some good to that, too. I don't want to totally discount that. Absolutely. Um, yes. Like hard work, um, kind of salt of the earth kind of people. Because if you just go by, I mean, Dr. Manhattan makes a lot more sense, right? Or, I don't know, I didn't watch the movie, but I'm familiar with the idea, and I honestly didn't really have to watch the movie to understand what was going to happen. There's a, a boy who has Superman like powers called, I think it's called mm-hmm. bright. I don't know if you've yes. watched it or you've heard of it, but just like, I mean, if my four year old had Superman powers, like a lot of times we skip that with Superman. It's like, I don't, I don't think that would go the way you think it would. <laughs> it's so important for a kid to not have physical power over their parents. Right. Because mm-hmm. They don't understand ethics. Um, this well, the, the goes Twilight back Zone to... episode, the, the famous Twilight Zone episode where, where the boy wishes uh, everybody out into the cornfields, right? He, he says anytime, basically he, he holds an entire town hostage. Yeah. And everyone has to be kind to him because he has these, these powers that he can just make things, yeah. he can create things on a whim, he can make them disappear. And if you're not good to him, if you're not nice to him, he'll wish yeah. you away. Yes. Yeah, which is super scary. Right. Uh, and that's, uh, man, there's, a, yeah, we can go in all sorts of uh, directions yeah. with that. I did want to mention before we go too far, um, and I, I, we don't have to get into why, but it is so funny to me that the DC animated universe is so much better than the live action oh, in terms of storytelling. By a lot. It's, everyone la- yeah, everyone laughs about it. It's unreal. But, um, I mean, I want to see john constantine done right he's probably my yeah. favorite superhero like but anyways that's just i, I like league i, I want to plug that in there <laughs> yeah you have both the just justice league dark movies yes in the animated universe of dc which are absolutely phenomenal and i'm gonna yep. be honest with you i don't even hate the keanu reeves constantine it has grown on me that movie <laughs> has actually grown on me yeah. believe it or not but you could still do it really well and i'm a big proponent of rebooting the entire dceu the the live action universe i think they wasted they wasted the talent that was there i think at some point you need to just admit it and and this still connects with what we're talking about too because i am a big believer in needing these exemplars and or ideals as well yeah and i do think you you need to have the ideal of superman even if it's hokey at times and he is the boy scout there is something to the idea of trying to teach young people especially there will be a time in a situation where you might have more power than those around you yes and the idea is not for you to show that to everyone the idea is if you if you can hold back and instead make those around you better yeah 
Well, and you, we talk, kind of talked about, uh, when you talked about neo-modernism and the Marvel Universe, that they went with uh, simpler stories, stories mm-hmm. you can believe in. It's very important. And uh, through my work in, uh, my, my work, my reading and studying in Gadamer, I found uh, Jean-Baptiste Vico. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he was one of the first real critics of Descartes. And so the Cartesian method, breaking things down into the littlest component, you know, if you read the meditations, and then slowly building it back up. Uh, one of the critiques has always been, sometimes the whole is more than the sum of its parts, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but it is, it's a great way to do science, which is why I think you see the explosion of math and science after the Cartesian method, which I'm not going to, we're talking on computers. It's like, so I, I don't want to just bash <laughs> Descartes, but uh Vico was a teacher at a university and his whole thing, um, he had some weird ideas, right? Like they all like, uh, so <laughs> he, he was trying to do armchair anthropology. So like he had like some, some very strange origins of like human, different human institutions. The idea was, was a pretty good one, but like, I remember there's like a whole chapter on like how humans pooping led to certain institutional developments and I was just like, I, I, what made you think that? So that, that was not the, I was like, okay. But he has one small book that's a critique of Descartes. And it's, his whole critique of Descartes is, you cannot start from little logical statements and slowly build them up with children. Mm. You can't do that. You can't be like, well, because of this, then this, then this. And because Descartes, and there's a lot of value in philosophy in doing this, you know, going 8, 20, 30, 40 logical steps, and then you like, see what you built. Like, you can do some amazing things with that. But you can't live that way. You can't do that. He's like, no one has time to do that with everybody. And like, everyone has to do different things. We need to rely on the wisdom of the past and we need to just give maxims for living and then let them discover the complexity later on. You start with simple, which isn't smaller. You know, you don't get all the way down to the details. It's better to have, like, I'd rather teach my son about Superman than, um, at four, let me, let me be clear, at four years old, than Afghan soldiers uh, who are struggling with PTSD, right? I, and to be clear, I, I'm happy to say, you know, thank you for your service. Hey, you should, you know, I, I see your posts on LinkedIn and made me think of it. But like, I'm not going to get into the cost of, and trauma of war with my four-year-old, right? No, like, there's too much that... for them to misunderstand. <laughs> there's complexity yes. there that, that is so abstract that there's no way that they could understand even that the, even the, the heroism part and the suffering of it. They couldn't understand that. They would just see the suffering and that's it. Right. And they're, and they're, and they're going to try and like, wait, and you have to understand how malleable their minds are and they take away weird lessons. Like I'm feeling this right. very much, a, you know, a dad of like a four and six year old. So <laughs> like they might be like, oh, it's cool to have PTSD, which is a horrible uh, sentiment, but that's right. just the sort of thing. It's like, um, you know, it's like, well, that's what heroes do. They have PTSD. It's like, no, no, that's, that's part of their sacrifice. That's not mm-hmm. like, and that's where you add more details and you add more suffering and you have more realization about the world, the more mature you are. And so it's good to have these simple stories. And so this is just me agreeing with you. Like I, I love Superman or um, uh, I'm watching One Piece with uh, my boys, uh, which is an anime about a pirate captain. And he basically, he's friends with everybody unless someone, unless someone is mean to him first. He like immediately gives friendship easily. And his other thing is he is willing to die for his dream. Like, he's like, I would rather die than not live the life I want to live. And I'll be honest, I would, I, I think that's a great lesson for, for kids to learn. It's like, there's nothing worse than living a life without purpose, which is really for me what I, and that's what I kind of reiterate with them. Um, it's a very simple, like the stories are incredibly simple, right? It's like, it's an yeah. adventure story. It's aimed at, uh, kids, but I, I just think that's, um, so I, all that to say, I, I agree with you. And I, th- I think that is the value of something like, uh, we see different exemplars used in different ways, right? And that's, you have to recognize 
one of the things about postmodernism is it got so deconstructive that then people, and they, they do talk about this, like the ultimate examples of postmodern literature are ones where you have to put the story together. Right? The yeah. ones where like you, it doesn't make sense unless you're, like that's why, um, and maybe I'm misunderstanding because I can't say I've read it. Uh, read a few pages, I was like, okay, I, I need more time. But like, you know, you look at James Joyce, um, is it sure. Finnegan's Wake, that's pure stream of oh, consciousness. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, that, that takes a lot of effort to reconstruct, right? Um, and so uh, that's something for a mature reader. I'm not going to hand that to, uh, honestly, most adults. Most adults are not going to appreciate that. That's something like I have to have uninterrupted time to like go and appreciate because it's it's a difficult read you know uh, i yeah, love I'm, proust I'm, but go ahead go ahead no no i was just gonna say that with finnegan's wake especially so i i don't usually i don't recommend people read finnegan's wake honestly i, I think <laughs> ulysses ulysses is difficult enough as it yeah. is and i actually do recommend people use even a a a reader with Ulysses yeah. to enjoy it. Not so much for, because I, I'm saying that you, you can't understand it. It's not about that. Yeah. It's about, there is a certain enjoyment that comes from reading something after you read a chapter so that you can kind of stay with what Joyce is trying to do. My problem yeah. with Finnegan's Wake was always that I felt as though it was Joyce having fun at the reader's expense. <laughs> and I did not appreciate that, quite honestly. And I know... <laughs> Joyce scholars are going to be very upset with me <laughs> for saying that. Yeah. But I maintain that Finnegan's Wake is Joyce just saying, you know, good luck with this. Here you go. Yeah. Try to find yeah, meaning. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And I, so I, I think in terms of to bring it all the way back around to your question about individual suffering, it's important uh, to develop increasing. Uh, it, it doesn't have to be reading. Right. I'm using that because that's what like um, I do think there is and th this is something I'm still weighing through, but I do think there is a moral imperative to develop your taste. And you, if you talk about in terms of taste, that gets kind of sketchy. But if you talk in terms of judgment, which is really what I think taste is and discernment, which I think there's definite definite moral imperatives for that. However you get there, you have to be able to be the one at the forefront. You know, I, I am now 32. So I moved from being, even in your 20s, like you're not the person that people look at in the room. There is something, you know, I don't know if it's biblical. I don't know if this is our Judeo-Christian roots. As soon as I hit 30, people started treating me differently. They would look at me and see how I respond, right? And some of that are some decisions I made to start running my own company but uh, I was talking to a friend the other day and he, you know, being, uh, being a man for uh, my wife and my kids, and I know my wife feels pressure too, so I don't want to take away from that. But like, it's a, it's a heavy burden. You know, like talk about Magnificent Seven, there's that speech where they're like, oh, you're gunslingers. You're so courageous. It's like, look at your fathers. They are courageous. Every day they bear this, this responsibility of providing for you. And, you know, and I also play the role a little bit of stay-at-home dad. I homeschool my kids. Uh, my mom's watching them right now. And the idea of shaping a young mind and realizing that they are soaking everything you say up, whether it's right, whether it's wrong, whether it's moral or immoral, um, these are all heavy, heavy responsibilities. So... <sighs> Well, let me ask you this then, because I, I was going to bring this up as a, as a question. I was going to bring up that you, you talk quite a bit about father-son relationships. Do you see a kind of crisis there, or do you see something that we, we need to talk about maybe better? Um, I think there is definitely... Uh... As our culture splinters, and I think this feeds well into your, your question you want to talk about with the contentious atmosphere. As the culture splinters, uh, I thoroughly believe in the theology of the body as presented in the Bible, which means that when you look at the church, every single person has something they're gifted to do. 
I am not good at building things. Like if the world was made of PJ, there would be no, <laughs> like the, everything would be broken. There would be, there would have been multiple Chernobyls because I would have forgotten because I was looking at a bird out the window because I'm an idiot, right? Um, but I do think there are things I am good at, right? Reading, writing, kind of my strengths. So when we talk about every man ha ha who is a father has a responsibility as a father, not all men are going to have the same capacity to figure out exactly what they're supposed to do. And the way that society deals with that is it gives them paths to follow. And that's really important. So like, uh, I know how to go. I'm like, oh, it's time for my oil change. I know what my responsibilities are. I don't know what happens when an oil change. I'm just going to be honest. Like, <laughs> and people are like, oh, you should learn that. I'm like, yeah, there's like thousands of things I should learn, but I don't have time for this one. So I'm just going to go take it and they're going to take care of it. And so uh, this is why you see all sorts of, um, and this is something that America in particular uh, struggles with. Um, you see initiation rights into manhood all the time, right? It's like, now you are responsible. That's something I've actually created for my, my kids. I created, I have one, they, I call them, you're, you're not a baby, you're a big boy. And then when they, on their fifth birthday, I have, um, uh, the German word, uh, is, uh, Bildung. And so I call it, it's a, it's a this is your Bildung. This is about your formation as a person. You are, you are coming into responsibility. And after that, I'm like, you're not a big boy anymore. You're a little man. And then my goal is to do that at 12, to have the Ausbildung, which is where, uh, that was generally, you become good at specific vocation. But that's something I created out of my head, right? That's something I'm like, I need to give my boys a path to follow. As the culture continues to splinter, that's a lot of responsibility to put on one person. That's my gifting is to think of things like that. But to have a guy who's working 60 hours, maybe he's driving truck for two weeks mm -hmm. and he doesn't like to read, which is not a problem, right? That's fine. But to be like, hey, you need to create a culture for your kid. You need to figure out how to guide them is it's an overwhelming burden. And so I think it's as we continue to splinter, we're losing these narratives and and we're also seeing uh, weird generational gaps in narratives. So we're seeing problems between parents and children because they're using different stories. And so it can be, I, I, don't, I don't think of it as a crisis per se. I think it's something that we can handle, but I think it is, it is one of the problems that we're facing. Uh, it's just one of the many uh, victims, if you want to put it that way, of our culture in many ways uh, collapsing. The cultural narrative collapsing is that we don't have okay this is how i raise my kid um or this is, or just like i mean you look at jewish culture culture they have a bar mitzvah and even if the kid's not fully into it there is you know like not like a lot of kids leave the jewish faith there is that formation of like what it means to be a man and even if you lose and we see this a lot in a judeo-christian culture People keep Judeo-Christian habitus, that connection between like that body language, that encoded manners, even when they l leave the general system of it. And sure. so, um, I, I, so I don't know if that all made sense, but no, no, it that, did. that would be my make... answer to that. Yeah, I think it makes sense because it, again, it builds into that larger problem, I think, that we're seeing in the wake of postmodern fracturing. And the idea right. that we've deconstructed narrative so much in the end of postmodernism that now that we're trying to build up shared narrative again, the problem is we're building individual narratives. Right. And so because of that, it's becoming very difficult to find these moments to, to have cultural sharing or even these, like, I like the idea that you have you have these moments built in, these pathways built in for your own children. That's your collective narrative with them. And yeah. in some sense, it's also a kind of private narrative. It's your, what, what I would call your sacred space, that you yeah. don't necessarily need other people coming in to that. That's just your own, right? 
I actually have but, other men that I know and trust come in and be part of that. Right. Oh. So it, it, I'm creating a small community of people. I'm like, mm -hmm. these are the men that I want you to look up to and trust and follow. So sorry, I, I, not that that distracts from your point. It just like helps fill it out. No, no, no. It's 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 your space to build. That's the whole point, yeah. right? Is you build right. it yourself. <laughs> and and so it's it's perfectly fine to add to have as many people as you want in that. But you're you. It's that discernment you talked about again too before. You have to actually have an opinion and you have to stand behind it and you have to build yeah. it like you're building a house right you have yeah. to have that that structure there and i think until we i think we're going to spend our entire neo-modern lives building a house and and by yeah. the end of neo-modernism that house is going to be really strong it's going to be wonderful and then the rubber band of historical movements will snap and we're going to move into the next <laughs> movement. This is yeah, sort whatever of the, that human, is, yeah. the human way in, in modernity post, you know, let's mm -hmm. say the Enlightenment, where we recognized ourselves and our own sovereignty, which I think Charles Taylor also, he talks a lot about that, how we have not actually still dealt with that problem of modernity. And, and maybe we never will. I could definitely see a, a point where we almost never will really come to terms yeah. with that. what that means, that we have individual sovereignty in a collective group as well. I think maybe we're always going to be fighting that battle, and maybe that's a battle that we're just meant to fight. Yes, I, I Gadamer uh, referred to, I think it's Rilke, the poet, um, talking about we can't touch or grasp it, but the iron law that's set in the eternity of the heavens I'm butchering the, the phrase, but just that idea of like, some people tend to think in historical movements as complete and absolute things, but that I do believe that there is absolute truth and that it peaks through in certain moments. And so what maybe we're seeing because we keep coming back to these same problems is that maybe this is a universal and absolute problem, you know? And I think that's where, you know, I, I mean, gravity doesn't change, right? It becomes more complex and we learn more about it, but it doesn't change. And it's, it's really interesting. Like the details never change. It's just our understanding of them as we add more details. So, um, I don't know where I was going with that, but, uh, <laughs> I just okay. wanted to tag it. Yeah. As we were talking about, <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, I was going to say, uh, as you're saying, maybe that's something we're always supposed to deal with. I do think sometimes we just have things that are these are continual struggles i mean that's why uh so i'm presbyterian um and you know we believe in the original depravity of man right like <laughs> i do believe like when people are like i think pe people are essentially good and i don't i don't think that and i know that like that makes people really angry it's like it and my response is it takes so much effort to be a good person and to create a good community. It's really easy to be a bad person. Like, I, I, yeah. and to be a cowardly person and to give in at the slightest struggle. And so for me, that's, I, I think that's something we're always going to struggle with, right? Like there's always going to be people, um, you don't have to teach kids to gang up on each other. You don't have to teach no. kids to bully. You don't have to teach them to steal. You don't have to teach them to lie. And I think like this whole thing of like, uh, we'll build good systems. And then someone will get to the top because they want to be at the top, not because they want to help the system. Not that I want to get political, but <laughs> you know, I mean, like, <laughs> I don't think anyone, like, regardless of par party, like, you just you look at it, and you're like, you know, I think Congress members, uh, the majority of them have our good, you know, I'm sure there's like a few good men, but the majority of them, I, d I just don't believe they have our our best interests at heart, right? Like, I just, I don't. And you know, you can call that cynicism, whatever you want. I that's that's what I see. And so that's, but that's something that we see throughout history. When you read history and you see like leaders and it becomes very apparent by the decisions they make that it's, it's not about, it's not about who's following them. It's about what, what power they can achieve. I mean, look at, watch Alexander get really mad because his troops won't conquer more lands because they've been away from their family for like 10 years. Or I don't remember the, it's like, you're like, yeah, that would make me mad too. And so uh, I don't I don't think like people are like, oh, you're picking on America. I'm like, 
no, no, I think this is like, this is a human nature thing. This is a historical thing. And I think it's a real thing. I think that's, that's, it always comes through in different ways, but I think absolute truth is out there. But the idea that I'm like, then I'm like, well, this is absolute truth. And then I can base everything off of this. As soon as you start making interpretational calls, um, uh, Record calls them wagers, which I really like because every time you make an interpretation, you're risking something because you're mm -hmm. going to make decisions based on that. Uh, every time you do that, you get further and further away from things that like you're, you're getting further and further away from details, right? Every time mm. you try and pull more details together, you're creating a narrative and that narrative is going to have more and more flaws the bigger it gets, um, if that makes sense. So, yeah, let let me ask you something. Uh, so I have just a couple of questions left sure. for you here, and I'm very curious about this. What is or who is one philosopher that you're currently kind of wrestling with right now and why? Uh, Charles Taylor. I've just started Language Animal, mm. and it's already been uh, really huge and helpful. Um, for me, I'm trying to and I'm, I'm trying to get back into reading Greek. I'm having my son do that with me, uh, ancient Greek. Uh, nice. so he's like doing the alphabet and everything. Uh, I want to go back to Plato and Aristotle because I feel like that's a really good grounding. Um, for me, I am very slowly because I'm also, you know, I run a digital agency with my, my wife. I I'm homeschooling my two boys and I'm running two podcasts. So <laughs> when I that's can squeeze lot. it in, I'm trying to build towards that PhD and I don't want I don't like the academic experience of just stretching to finish it. I'd rather go in and have it be like the capstone of knowledge I already have. Mm, and so yeah. for me, I'm slowly building towards that understanding of philosophy of art. So the language animal is, uh, I think, uh, consistent with the project I'm already working on in terms of philosophy of language, which if I'm going to do philosophy of art, especially focusing on literature, which is kind of like my first love, that's, I, I'm going to have to understand how language works. Um, <laughs> that's just kind of a, yeah. so I, that's a, I'm kind of working through that. Um, and of course, uh, the way that most of the philosophers I enjoy work is they mention a lot of other philosophers. Like some philosophers like to do lots of like propositional statements and you can, if you, it takes a lot of reasoning, but you just follow that. Other guys like to reference other work and say, if you want to understand why I'm saying this, go back here. And that's very dangerous because then you end up buying a bunch of books that you may oh, yeah. or may not read. Like, <laughs> but the one that I've just really been enjoying is um, Dominion of the Dead. Uh, I think it's Harris or Harrison. But uh, literally, I just stopped and thought for all. It's, it, it's wonderful when you have those like kind of um, light bulb moments, you know, to use the colloquial term. Uh, he was talking about architecture. And he said, architecture is uh, m taking meaning and um, changing matter into meaning. And it's taking geological time and transforming it into human time. And it was like, really, you know, because when you watch glaciers move, it doesn't really work. But you're creating and you're wrapping the world in human time when you create a building. This is our space. And so mm. that's part of the reason, as he, and the reason he talks about this is with Dominion of the Dead, we often feel very odd. We have these, uh, this kind of uneasy feeling when confronted with ruins, when we're confronted with uh, a house falling into disrepair. And the reason for that is because we're watching meaning break down, back down into matter. It's literally happening in front of our eyes and we're watching human time disintegrate into geological time, which is so vast that our mind, like when we talk about 300 million years or however, you know, a million years, a thousand years, and we're talking like we know what we're talking about, we're not really grasping that. And so, uh, I mean that, that I just read, uh, on a trip, I went with my dad up to new England and it was actually fascinating because we were literally going through his childhood. That's what he wanted to do. He wanted to show us where his childhood was. And it was interesting, interesting to see what had stayed the same and what had changed. And so, uh, that was kind of, that was a cool moment. So that was, that was one thing I've been <laughs> working through. That's great. And this, this is more of a joke, kind of fun question, but who is a sure. philosopher that you just refuse to wrestle with? Cause you're just like, I don't like you. <laughs> oh, um, 
That's a actually it's a it's a hard one. Most of the time, I'll <laughs> I'll read a couple pages and I'll just be like, yeah, it's not for me. I'm. It's normally. I mean. The one that I know I need to read more of because it, he's just foundational for a lot of the work I want to do, but uh, I, I just do not like reading Hegel. Um, he's <laughs> he's really long winded, and um, you don't have as many light bulb moments because he takes a long time getting there. And yeah. I do feel you know uh, even with Kant, like you can pick up a new concept in a in a paragraph, you know, and that's like my favorite is like when you read Gadamer or um charles taylor like there's a very specific style that i really enjoy which is where every sentence is very carefully thought out and you're it, yes you, you're they're building concept on concept and i'm literally learning like my mind is just overloaded and it i love that feeling of like there's so much here you know i, I remember the first time i read Gadamer and um i had a very high reading level right that like that's that's my gifting and uh, it was the first time in my life I would read 20 pages and my vision would literally start to blur because it was just so much information. Uh, and so that would that always felt really good. Hegel, on the other hand, like my vision would start to blur, but it, that's because I was just like, I don't know. What, what does this have to do with anything? Like I didn't learn anything for the last several pages. And then like you get to, and you're like, okay, I kind of get what you're getting at here. But you know, and maybe it was, the, the truth is it might be, I don't think it's entirely, but it could also be the translation. You know what I mean? It's uh, there's also yeah, always that sure. that fear as well. But um, yeah. No, there will be times I, when I, I'll talk to Hegelian scholars, and yeah. I'll sit there and I'll go, "Wait, where did you get that?" You know, like almost in disbelief, <laughs> like, "No, no, you're making that up." He's, "Where did you get that?" <laughs> you know, like, and I'll have to go back through and kind of see, like, "Oh, okay, yeah, that is the, that is there." <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I, I, yeah, I, I feel like there's a little bit of um. Uh, and maybe, you know, it's just how different people's brains work. Like people talked about like Heidegger is very difficult to read. When I read Heidegger, he makes a lot of sense to me. Mm. And I think some of that's just personality. Like when I read him, I'm like, I'm like, oh, he's obviously talking about this, but it's not very clear in the text because he's pushing the boundaries of human language. And I think Hegel's probably right. the same way, but my personality is just like, what are you talking about? You know? And it's like, I, my brain doesn't work the same way. Um, so maybe that's it. I don't know. I, he's definitely, uh, he sits on my shelf and I look at him and I scowl. That's definitely <laughs> <laughs> the philosopher's scowl, if you will. Right. Yeah. I'd like, it's like, yeah, I just like, oh, like, you know, just awful. Um, yeah, that was yeah. always Derrida for me in grad school. It was always, I like Derrida. I, I have to read Derrida. Oh, <laughs> you know. Oh, jeez. You know, and every scholar had every, it didn't matter if you were philosophy or if you were literature, you right. had to have it on your shelf at least somewhere. Oh, yeah. Just so you wouldn't feel like you were an outcast. See, this is a great example, and I'm glad you asked this question, because I love reading Derrida. And I'm like, I uh, many times I feel like I'm the only one. Like, I'm like, I enjoy like what he does with language and all this stuff. And then, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, obviously I'm reading in English. Um, but it's just, uh, I hear other like, you know, people are just like, I don't understand. And I'm like, what, what's not to understand? But then I read Hegel and people are like, what, why don't, how do you not get this? And I'm like, I don't know. And so, um, especially at that kind of level, I mean, you do start to see, it's kind of, if you, pr if you really push into cooking, for instance, there are like obvious things that everyone should do with cooking, right? Like if you're, if you're not using any salt at all, it's going to be very boring, right? But at some level, you start to get into individual taste where discretion is more about who you are and what identity matters to you. And I think in a lot of ways, like, like there's, I do believe in this great conversation that is worth continuing to have. I don't believe that it'll happen no matter what. I think we could lose our civilization in a catastrophe, but I think it'd be really hard to do. Who knows? I, I, I think we're going to keep it going and I want to see where that goes. And I think you can find the names that have contributed to that. And if you're reading it, you're reading the best our culture has to offer. And in that way, I'm, I, I do, I've been influenced by Hegel, but uh, it's really funny. Like they're definite conversation partners that you're like, yeah, I'm going to go over here to this side of the coffee shop, you know, this side of the bar. And like, <laughs> like cause this is like, I mean, I know people who hate Kierkegaard and Kierkegaard's one of my favorite guys to read, but, um, and I know part of the reason is he's so indirect, 
but that's always been such a joy to me. And it's not like you still learn things along the way, but you're just like, what's the main point? Like I'm learning things. That's interesting. You're making really savvy and interesting points, but I don't know where it's going. Um, and the perfect example of this, and it's influenced me a lot, probably too much because people are like, where are you going? Where's your main point? But the concept of anxiety, he talks about Adam and Eve and the first sin. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've read concept of anxiety. The, um, so long time ago. It, yes. So he doesn't get to the main point, which his whole point is the psychological state of mind that is anxiety until like 120, mm -hmm. 140 pages in. Yeah. And all, and, but it's just that moment. It's like you're going this way. And he says at the beginning, he's going to do this, that he's going to enter in sideways. All of a sudden, you just like the whole thing shifts and everything comes into focus. And that, that moment is fantastic. And I actually don't even care about the concept of anxiety. But what it did in terms of like, oh, you can solve philosophical problems this way, that in a lot of ways, um, I mean, here's a good example of philosophers that work for some people, not for others. Some people hate Wittgenstein. They hate, like, I mean, he's been made fun of by Monty Python. It's like, philosophy is like, you know, uh, <laughs> beads of sweat on a maiden's mustache. You know, it's like, they're like, <laughs> they're like using all these weird metaphors and stuff like that. And that's definitely like, he loved to speak in these statements. But for me, he's always been, he's always given one of my favorite de definitions of philosophy, which is philosophy is helping the fly get out of the bottle. And people mm. are like, what does that mean? And I'm like, you know what that means. Like if you've ever had a bee in your car and you were trying to get it out and it kept hitting the windshield because it thought it could see out, but it was actually stuck. That's what yeah. to me, um, because of my focus on dialogue, my, my love for deeper and longer conversations, to me, that's what philosophy really is. If you can solve a problem simply, it probably doesn't need to be in philosophy. Philosophy is for when we work ourselves in knots because we think we can see the end, but actually we're just hitting the glass and we have to go backwards and around. And so, uh, that's perfect. That's, I, yeah. I love, I love, that's why I love Kierkegaard. Like more than, more than, uh, even the, the content was great, but the method for doing it, I think is, uh, is a very valuable, especially as we start to like, we are in such a vast wasteland as a culture of like people in just different places. And I often think of these discussions as like, we are creating a map and we're trying to get certain people to share horizons. That's a, uh, like Godmer is the one who really pushed that like fusion of horizons idea. Um, kind of taken, I think from Nietzsche as well, but just that we're new, we don't have to have the same viewpoint because I can't use your eyeballs, but we can share the same horizon. So we have to have dialogue that helps us, to get to the same place. And so if you come to a cliff and you can hear someone just on the other side, the answer is not to try and scale the cliff. The answer is let's walk around this way. Look, Hey, just come over here. You know, like come around. And so, um, I think, you know, even for what you're doing here and I love it with the neutral ground podcast, the idea of like, uh, we have these obstacles that we have erected, um, or that have just shown up. Like it's not always people doing it intentionally, uh, between us. And we can find, by finding things we agree on over here, we can find ways to maneuver around the obstacle, or maybe we we walk over here together. Um, I just, uh, I've, I've been pushing stuff on my YouTube channel, and I just had an atheist respond. I did a little video on uh, what I meant by chasing Leviathan about pursuing truth and its, uh, in all its complexity and beauty and magnificence. And I had an atheist respond, and say, I really like what you're saying. And then he posted a video of, uh, I think it's Richard Feynman. It's Feynman, I know it's the last name, talking about how beautiful science is. Mm -hmm. And so we have vastly different metaphysical presuppositions. But what we do share is a commitment to the truth and a commitment to changing as we are approached with new information and also just appreciating the wonder and beauty of what we are pursuing. And that's, that's a great place to start. It's way better than like, you're over there and I'm over here and let's just run at each other and see who gets run over. Yeah, that reminds me too of just recently I came across uh, in the Critique of Pure Reason, uh, uh, something that never clicked with me before with Kant was this idea of the distrust that we have for others who, we, we can take the fact that people have different tastes, that's fine. 
But he says something along the lines of, we distrust individuals who cannot experience something sublime with us. And what I loved about reading that recently was similar to what you just said, whether it's the, you know, if we're all looking at a sunrise, you can look at that sunrise from a godly perspective and appreciate the beauty and the wonder of it. Or you can look at it from a purely scientific perspective of what's happening and you can still, all of us can enjoy that beautiful sublime moment when the light just kisses the earth. And yeah. we can all just stand there and go, that's wonderful. And we're experiencing it together, which is even more wonderful. Yes, absolutely. Well, th this is, this has been wonderful for me. Yes. I enjoyed this tremendously. So tell, tell us PJ, where, where can people find you and what can you tell us about uh, your podcast and other projects you're working on as well? Um, so you can find us candid goat productions on uh, YouTube. Uh, so candid, like honest, and then goat, like the animal. And so, uh, uh, that's where we put all our podcasts together. Uh, if you look for Weary Dads, that's uh, W E H R Y, that you can find that where podcasts are. Um, that's kind of a, a Christian approach to masculinity and manhood. Uh, I'm doing that with my dad, and it's, uh, I mean, that's a that's a precious thing, right? Um, and then Chasing Leviathan, uh, you can find that just about anywhere. Uh, we do a lot of shorts, and then we have the longer form podcast. So uh, apart from that, I mean, just. Uh, uh, I, I struggle with starting too many projects, so <laughs> we'll keep it to the, we'll keep it to the podcast so that I can focus and, uh, and Nara, you know, I, I would love to write that, um, philosophy book someday. Um, so we'll just see, we'll see what happens, but appreciate it. Thank you. That's wonderful. Great to Thank be you on PJ here. for joining us. Well, I hope you've enjoyed my conversation with PJ Weary, and I encourage you to check out his podcasts in the show notes below. They provide a great deal of hope and motivation to focus one's life on the things that matter most. If you enjoyed this episode, then help me bring my message of civil discourse to more ears by clicking the subscribe slash follow button, leaving a kind rating where applicable, and sharing the Neutral Ground podcast with some friends via your social media accounts. And head over to the neutralgroundpodcast.com where you can drop me a message about the episode or the show. I welcome the interaction. Until next time, try to keep one foot firmly planted on the neutral ground and have a great day. <laughs>